Welcome back, Alex here, talking about correlation and regression. We have in the first part of the screencast series talked about correlation. What are some of the ways that we can visualize it using scatter plots? What does it look like when we calculate it? Um, what are the, the test statistics, the R uh, coefficients mean when we were, and there's the massive equation for that, when we were calculating the uh, association between tree height and trunk diameter in our uh, little an sort of analysis. And then we stopped when we started talking about significance testing for correlation. As with anything, uh, significance testing involves uh, a, a, another test statistic that we can calculate using the correlation coefficient um, and simply the n minus 2, which is the degrees of freedom. That will give us a way to calculate the uh, the value that uh, of the the probability of committing a type one error the probability that we are saying there's an association when actually there is none so we can ask is there evidence of a linear relationship between tree height and trunk diameter at the point zero five level of significance and as we know that we we can calculate what critical values are and we can calculate what the actual value the actual probability or p value is uh, for our different uh, test statistics. In this case, we're calculating a, a, a probability of committing a type 1 error, or probability that we're saying something is uh, associated when it is not, using again the correlation coefficient itself, and it comes up with a test statistic for us. Now, the same way that we would do with any sort of uh, significance testing, we come back to our normally distributed curve. And we set limits about when we can and cannot reject the null hypothesis. And we do that by using critical values. And critical values are, are calculated ahead of time. There are thresholds that have been calculated uh, by our predecessors, thanks to them. Uh, we looked in class yesterday at the work of William Gossett for the t-test. Um, we're not doing a t-test here. That's not what this t means. We're doing a test test statistic, uh, simply a way of getting the critical value when we're looking at R. And if we get a calculated probability that or, or value that is higher than our critical value, we get to reject the null hypothesis because it would fall in the extreme areas. Well, if, as we can see here, there is evidence of a linear relationship at the 5% level of significance, the P is less than 0 0.05 and so we could say that there is a significant association a statistically significant association between tree height and trunk diameter in our fun little example now if we move on a little bit we can see that regression analysis is also a way to look at the relationship between two variables and it also is looking at linear relations we're looking at linear regression Regression analysis is used to predict the value of a dependent variable based on the value of at least one independent variable and to explain the impact of changes in an independent variable on the dependent variable. So we use it for both of these purposes. We predict the value or we predict the impact. That's what we're doing. Now, we all know what these are, but just for review, the dependent variable is the variable we wish to explain. We also sometimes call it the outcome variable. And the independent variable is the variable used to explain the dependent variable. In other words, the change in the dependent variable depends on change in the independent variable. In simple linear regression, we only use one independent variable. We'll call that x. And the relationship between x and y, and y will be our dependent variable, is described by a linear function or an equation where changes in y are assumed to be caused by changes in x. If we try to plot these kinds of relationships, we can see that in many ways they're very similar to our scatter plots for the correlation relationships. right? Linear positive relationships uh, tend to trend upward when one 
variable rises, the other variable rises. Negative relationships do just the opposite. When one variable rises, the other variable drops. There are also relationships that are not linear. This is not what we're talking about right now. We're not talking about calculations for nonlinear regression. And we're also aware that a no relationship is flat. And the other way to look at it is there are dots everywhere. And there's no way to plot a, a line that is either positive or negative. Now, if we were to look at the equation or the function for a linear regression, this is what it looks like. We have the dependent variable, and that's the outcome. So everything on this side of the uh, equal sign is the outcome, and the dependent variable sits there. We have the what's called the y-intercept, and that's either beta or b sub zero. We have the independent variable, whatever that is, and the slope coefficient, which shows how much change in y you get for every one unit of change in x. And then we have the part here that says, oops, sometimes there's random error. So we get an, a residual. Error values are statistically independent. They are normally distributed for any given value of x. All right, that's good to know. The probability distribution of the er errors is normal. The probability distribution of the errors has constant variance. And the underlying relationship between the x variable and the y variable is linear. So we have a lot of assumptions about the errors, because those are things that we're not necessarily accounting for in our linear relationship. And then we have the underlying association that our relationship is linear. And that's why it's often helpful to plot the, uh, the, the variables like this so that you can visually see does it look like it's a linear relationship or are we doing something that might be all curvy if it's curvy we need to do, we need to go away from the linear assumption if we were to look at what this means using the scatter plot uh, this is it right we have our our independent variable here that's the X we have our dependent variable here that's the Y we have the plotted line for our linear relationship. And then we have the error. So there is error that exists for each of the actual values for x and for y. right? Because they don't all sit on the regression line. There's always some sort of a gap. So that's the error that we're talking about. And so what's left over here is accounting for all of these gaps between the, the actual values and the plotted line. The beta sub zero is the intercept. In other words, when x is zero, that's here, this is what y is. So that's beta sub zero right here. And then the slope is simply a measure right here. For every one unit we go here, how much do we go here? That's it. Now, a sample regression line is the same thing. We've just, we've just replaced the betas with b's. Right? And we have uh, dropped the error term here because the individual random error terms have a mean of zero. In other words, if you added up all of these differences, it's going to be zero. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, again, here's the dependent variable. Here's the y-intercept. Here's the slope, or the coefficient. This is the regression coefficient that we are probably most interested in. Now, there are a couple of things that we should talk about behind this. One is that b sub 0 and b sub 1, are the, the two coefficients, the y-intercept and then the regression coefficient, are obtained by finding the values of each that minimize the sum of the squared residuals. Again, when in our plotted thing, remember we have values that are here, and we can look at the error between each of those values and the line. Now, if we take all of those and we square them, we want to make sure that we have the smallest sum of squared residuals that we can get for our plotted line. The formulas for each are there, although I don't expect you to actually calculate them by hand. 
All we need to know is that v sub 0 is the estimated average value of y when the value of x is 0. Here's x, here's y, here's our regression line. When x is 0, that's all the way down here, this then becomes v sub 0. It's the y-intercept. v sub 1 is the estimated change in the average value of y as a result of a one unit change in x. So if we go one unit over for x, how many units up on y is it before we reach that regression line? So that is our b sub 1. The coefficients b sub, sub 0 and b sub 1 will usually be found using computer software such as Excel or Minitab or in our case SPSS. And there are other regression measures that will also be computed as part of computer-based regression analysis. Let's look at an example and I'm going to uh, go through this example that is sort of laid out and then I'll also do an example uh, using SPSS so that you can see how it looks live. Let's use this example. A district administrator wishes to examine the relationship between the student performance measured in math test scores and the cost of computers for instruction per school. They're trying to see if they can improve, probably test scores, if they put computers in schools. So what they did at the district level is they took a random sample of 10 schools and the dependent variable would be the student test scores, the independent variable would be the computer costs. So this is what the data looks like. Each of these rows is a different school. There are 10. We have the average student math test scores and we have the average computer costs for each of these schools. And if we ran the regression, and again I'll walk through this using SPSS in a second, this is the kind of output we get. Now remember, when we were looking at our example for a regression equation before, this is like this. this. It's the same equation we've just now filled in each of the parts. So the dependent variable is test scores. The independent variable is computer costs. The y-intercept is 98.2. The regression coefficient is 0 0.10977. And you can see I've highlighted that, that this is here. Right? So you can see what it looks like. That's the, the intercept for us. It also will give us an ANOVA uh, when it spits out the regression output. This is a way of telling us if there is a difference between the uh, different cases that are in the equation. Right? We have uh, 10, 10 individual schools and we have two groups. So our degrees of freedom are 10 minus 2. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we can calculate the significance of F. We haven't really talked about ANOVA before in class, but you get a test statistic, you compare it with the critical value, and you can tell if the significance is less than 0.05, you have, uh, it, it's good. It means that things are statistically different. We also have the R squared, which is the coefficient of determination, and tells us how much of the variation in our dependent variable is explained by our independent variable variable section by our linear section. All right. If we were to plot out our example for computer costs per school and student test scores, this is what it looks like. Right? We have again test scores here, computer costs here, our y-intercept here, our slope here. It's the one unit. I'm, I'm exaggerating so you can see it. One unit increase in computer costs leads to how much increase in test scores. This how much increase in test scores part is right here. Okay. So there's not a huge increase in computer, I'm sorry, in test scores as a result from computer costs. The question is now, even though it's a small increase, is it a statistically significant increase? We're not quite there yet. 
So B sub zero is the estimated average value of Y, and we're going to pause here. 